For millennia, mankind has dreamed of peace. As our global community continues to evolve, as technology closes the geographic gaps between cultures, we find ourselves more and more occupied with the notion of peace. How should it be fostered? What are its obstacles? And is a great peace, a peace for all the world, attainable? To some, peace on Earth is not merely a possibility. It is an inevitability. Immediately within the grasp of mankind, People from all regions of the globe who have united under one banner, the Baha'i Faith. The ultimate goal of the faith, the mission of this religion, is to bring about the unification of mankind, to unite the world as one common species. You don't go to the Baha'i Center one day a week and then that's, that's it, and then you just live the rest of your, your other life. You know, there's no such thing. Baha'is think about the most great peace every day because this is really the time for unification. Today, the teachings are for the entire planet. Because of technology, we can now actually see that occur. We have the possibility of uniting the entire planet under these universal teachings. This is what we're working towards. The Baha'i religion is based on the teachings of a man named Baha'u'llah, which translates to the glory of God. To Baha'is, he's not simply a spiritual leader, but the latest in a series of divine prophets, which include Muhammad, Jesus, Moses, and Buddha. It was in Baghdad in 1863 when Baha'u'llah first identified himself as a direct messenger from God with a vision for the unification of man. Less than 150 years later, the Baha'i faith has grown into the second most widespread religion in the world. It represents an incredibly diverse cross-section of the globe. But in their brief and sometimes difficult history, we see just how troubled the road to peace can be. The story of the Baha'i faith begins with a religious group known as the Babis. The Babis developed out of a Shiite Muslim belief in the Bab, or Gate, a leader who would signal the impending arrival of the next divine savior. In 1844, a man named Ali Muhammad openly declared himself to be the Bab. Soon, surrounding Muslims were accepting the teachings of the Bab, and they became known as Babis. Their growth worried the Muslim leadership in Persia, and they worked to silence the Bab and his followers. The Bab was arrested and placed in a secluded prison to keep him isolated from the population. Despite his incarceration, the Babi population grew to nearly 100,000 in the late 1840s. In his writings, the Bab began to lay a groundwork for the Baha'i faith that was to follow. He said that God communicated to mankind through a series of divine messengers, beginning with Adam and continuing through Abraham, Moses, Buddha, Jesus, and Muhammad. He stated that another messenger, he whom God shall make manifest, would follow after him. In his writings, the Bab also described how this religion would eventually supersede Islam and this was viewed by the Shah as blasphemy against the Islamic faith. The government attempted to stamp out the Babis, and thousands of them were killed by the Persian army and fanatical mobs. In 1850, the Bab was executed by the Shah. 
Their hope was that the Babi movement would collapse without him. Two years after the death of the Bab, Baha'u'llah was arrested and spent four months in a Tehran prison. He was a member of a wealthy Persian family and a leader of the Babi faith. His own writings vividly describe the experience of his imprisonment. During the days I lay in the prison of Tehran, though the galling weight of the chains and the stench-filled air allowed me but little sleep, still in those infrequent moments of slumber, I felt as if something flowed from the crown of my head over my breast, even as a mighty torrent that precipitated itself upon the earth from the summit of a lofty mountain. Every limb of my body would, as a result, be set afire. At such moments, my tongue recited what no man could bear to hear. After his release, Baha'u'llah was exiled to Baghdad. There, in 1863, he declared openly that he was next in the line of divine messengers, fulfilling the role set forth by the Bab. In 1868, Baha'u'llah was exiled once again and forced to live in Akka, a remote outpost of the Ottoman Empire, part of modern-day Israel. He lived there for the remainder of his life, writing the texts that would come to define the Baha'i faith. During that time, Baha'u'llah also wrote a series of letters to the leaders of the world. In them, he announced the coming of a new era for mankind. He urged the creation of an international tribunal to act as a moderator between the different nations of the world. He also encouraged systems for unifying the nations of the world, including an international auxiliary language, compulsory education, and a decrease in military expenditures. Baha'u'llah continued to write until the end of his life. He revealed over 100 volumes, which comprise the basic scriptures of the Baha'i faith. On May 29, 1892, Baha'u'llah passed away. The resting place for his body is considered by Baha'is to be the most sacred place on earth. At the time of his writings, the scope of Baha'u'llah's thinking was revolutionary. His vision for a unified world foreshadowed the coming institutions of the next century, with first the League of Nations, and then later the UN. And for Baha'is, the unity of mankind is not merely something to be hoped for, it's God's ultimate plan for humanity. Everything that is necessary physically technologically is here to establish world unity and do away with do away with wars do away with hatred prejudice you know these are actually principles that people really do want you know I, I, I've never met anyone that said that they didn't want peace or that they didn't want unity achieved mankind will make this happen we are guaranteed that world peace will come about in fact Baha'u'llah promises something more than our current image of world peace, he promises the most great peace, where not only do we cease war, but the full range of human potentials will be discovered during these thousand years. It will begin a new era of understanding and of de human development, the like of which we have never seen before. The Baha'is see this transition to world unity as inevitable. And this surety plays an important role in Baha'i life. Their methods are for encouraging world peace, hoping to improve the world around them until the day when unity finally arrives. To say something is inevitable does not mean it's easy or that it will just come about uh, automatically. Uh, just like uh, when a child is growing, it's inevitable that they're going to get bigger and their skills are going to increase. But that doesn't mean it's easy going from a teenager to an adult. One of the common notions that unfortunately uh, has prevailed in the world is that many people believe 
that war is necessary and will always be with us, that humanity, humanity is fundamentally warlike. The Baha'i Faith teaches that is not true, that humanity fundamentally in their makeup are peace-loving. The society as a whole we see as going from adolescence, which is a very turbulent period where you're trying to find yourself, to as a society uh, going from that adolescent stage to an adult stage, more mature. Uh, that transition from teenage to adult years for an individual is very difficult and so is the society as a whole going from one stage to another. But it's still inevitable, provided you, you survive it, uh, that a teenager will become an adult. Of course, the world today is still full of strife and conflict. Racial and religious tensions still persist, and the vast separation between rich and poor remains an isolating factor in every part of the globe. So the question has to be, what is the alternative? Is there a better way for human beings to interrelate? Or will the next century be as full of conflict as the last? We live in a fundamentally divided society. The Baha'is believe that world unity will be achieved through a breaking down of those divisions on every possible level. To encourage this, Baha'is practice the teachings of unity given to them by Baha'u'llah. These teachings are often boiled down to 12 principles which guide every Baha'i in their work. Oneness of God. Oneness of mankind. Oneness of religion. The individual search for truth. Religion as the basis for unity. The essential harmony of science and religion equality of men and women, elimination of the extremes of wealth and poverty, a universal compulsory education, a spiritual solution to economic problems, a universal auxiliary language, and a world peace upheld by a world government. Of course, no one could possibly tackle all of these issues in one lifetime. These are principles and a set of goals with which Baha'is focus themselves and their actions. The Baha'is don't look to the unity of mankind as a purely political struggle. Rather, they see it as a personal and moral transformation that must take place across the face of humanity. In fact, despite their focus on world peace, Baha'is never engage in partisan political activities. They focus instead on spiritualizing their personal lives and on developing unified Baha'i communities. What we see today in the political scene worldwide, and especially in the United States, is a highly polarized population around politics. This shows that the purpose of government and politics, which is to mobilize human resources, has been forgotten and contention has become the mainstream. The mission of the faith is the unification of mankind. We see partisan politics as very divisive. So we are actually forbidden as Baha'is to run for partisan office or to, uh, or to um, to participate in partisan politics. Baha'u'llah has brought a way in which decisions can be arrived that benefit all people, not just a certain segment, while others have to suffer. In their message of peace, they call the Baha'i community a single social organism representative of the diversity of the human family. It is offered to the world as a model for study an example of how individuals from around the globe can come together in peaceful coexistence. The Universal House of Justice is the supreme ruling body of the faith and the heart of the Baha'i World Center in Haifa, Israel. The House oversees both the spiritual and administrative aspects of the Baha'i faith. Even on the international scale, the House operates much as the local spiritual assemblies do with nine members collectively deciding on the issues of the faith. From the World Center, the Baha'is maintain their visibility in the world community. 
in international organizations like the United Nations, Baha'is believe that the seed of mankind's potential is beginning to form. The Baha'i international community has non-governmental consultative status with the UN's Economic and Social Council, and they promote unity through an improved presence of the United Nations worldwide. They encourage world leaders to view peace as the next stage in the evolution of this planet. They also support over 300 global development projects a year. Baha'i pioneers foster the building of community in all corners of the globe. For many, this work is one of the clearest ways to express their faith. The Baha'is are helping in all aspects, not just in the community building, but also through their efforts at the United Nations to help educate the world on the new principles that have been brought by Baha'u'llah and we're very involved in something like the United Nations because the United Nations is about a coming together of the different nations and the different nations working in collaboration, which is very much in keeping with the principle of the unification of mankind. The difficult question then becomes, what steps can Baha'is take at home in their everyday lives to encourage peace? Is there a time and a place for it among the hustle and bustle of modern society? And will the message be accepted by those around them? In October of 1985, the Universal House of Justice, the governing body of the Baha'i Faith, sent a message of peace to all the people of the world. Much like the letters of Baha'u'llah, this message was personally sent to international leaders in hopes of fostering unity among the nations. The Great Peace, towards which people of goodwill throughout the centuries have inclined their hearts, of which seers and poets for countless generations have expressed their vision, and for which from age to age the sacred scriptures of mankind have constantly held the promise, is now at long last within the reach of the nations. This message was titled, The Promise of World Peace and it argued that peace was just within our grasp, the next stage in the evolution of this planet. But it warned that no serious attempt to achieve world peace can ignore religion. They believe that world order can be founded only on a spiritual belief in the oneness of humanity. Baha'u'llah called this belief the first fundamental prerequisite for the reorganization of the world as one country, the home of humankind. The promise of world peace expands on Baha'u'llah's vision, calling for no less than the reconstruction and the demilitarization of the whole civilized world, a world organically unified in all the essential aspects of its life, its political machinery, its spiritual aspiration, its trade and finance, its script and language, and yet infinite in the diversity of the national characteristics of its federated units. This is a far-reaching vision for the future of mankind, but the message of reconstruction is profound. If old institutions and ways of thought have become ineffective, then the time has come to move past them and allow our society to evolve. The promise of peace argues that these institutions are designed to help mankind, and we should not allow humanity to be crucified for the preservation of the integrity of any particular law or doctrine. This evolution will come through exploring and dismantling the root causes of strife and disharmony, rather than pressing band-aids to a thousand open wounds around the globe. In the promise of peace statement, the Universal House of Justice writes that banning particular weapons will not remove the root causes of war. Neither can the massive dislocation in the affairs of humanity be resolved through the settlement of specific conflicts. A genuine universal framework must be adopted. The issues of peace must be raised to the level of principle. For peace stems from an inner state supported by spiritual and moral attitude 
in which the possibility of enduring solutions can be found. Baha'is believe that we are all carrying forward an ever-advancing civilization, and that mankind has within it the capacity for continual growth. And by challenging the notion that mankind is naturally prone to conflict, we open up the possibilities for a unified future, once the framework for our institutions allow for it. The Baha'is have a vision for the pragmatic fulfillment of world peace in the form of a universal world government. This government consists of an executive power with the means to enforce international law, a world parliament representative of all nations, and a supreme tribunal with binding judgments. The ultimate directive of this government would be the establishment of peace among all the peoples of the world. For Baha'is, this is more than a pragmatic political arrangement. They believe that it's something that lies beyond questions of security and armaments and laws, that it's the crowning goal of unifying all the people of the world into a single universal family. Baha'u'llah, just like the Baha'is of today, believe that the world will achieve peace and security only when the human family embraces its unity. The final vision of that peace is a powerful one. They imagine a world once and for all free of racism, economic disparity, religious strife, and the subjugation of women. A world in which universal education and an international auxiliary language finally remove the barriers and borders that have separated humanity. The promise of world peace is a call to all those who have the same faith in mankind's potential, conveying not only a vision in words, we summon the power of deeds, of faith, and sacrifice. We convey the anxious plea of our co-religionists everywhere for peace and unity. The attainment of peace may appear difficult in a world that many feel is destined for continued conflict, but the Baha'is work towards their goals with a confidence that they will eventually see the unity they strive for. We believe that God, when he created mankind, had a plan for mankind. For the first time in the history of this planet, we have the capability of being one. Baha'u'llah says religion must be a source of unity and not a source of discord. And if it is, then it's useless. So this is our biggest um, work right now, is to spread the teachings of Baha'u'llah and the promises of Baha'u'llah. People talk about living a Baha'i way of life. That means like your inner life and private character, even the way, even when you're by yourself. It's not a platitude, it's not a, um, a just a good saying to a Baha'i. To us, that's the core of your very purpose. That is the essential teaching of the Baha'i faith, the unity of mankind. And that is what we as Baha'is try to bring about through our teachings and through our work in the world. The spirit that is moving mankind throughout history, it cannot be avoided. You cannot avoid this destiny. So mankind is being either doing it willingly and consciously as the Baha'is are engaged, or unconsciously and unwillingly kicking and screaming. But the steed of history is moving us forward. To members of the Baha'i faith, Religious beliefs are fundamentally interwoven with thoughts on politics, education, and other worldly issues. For the Baha'is, the arrival of peace is only a matter of time and a matter of faith. There's a quote from Baha'u'llah that echoes that belief. He told his followers that these fruitless strifes, these ruinous wars shall pass away and the most great peace shall come.